Hi, Saif, good morning. Uh, do you see me? I don't Hello, know in which direction I should look, but I think the camera is following me. You're seeing me, right? Yes, I see you. How are you? Okay, wonderful. I'm great. We have an amazing crowd here in Innsbruck. Uh, you're missing out, but uh, it's... We would have loved to be there. We would have absolutely loved to, but unfortunately... Uh, you're uh, hearing the uh, cheers, uh, right? Other... So I'm it's sorry? wonderful that you can be with us like that at least. Yes, hopefully next year, maybe. Wonderful. Yeah, and then you'll take your family along as well and enjoy <laughs> yeah. some mountains. Okay, uh, Saif, we not only share a passion for Austrian economics, but some Middle Eastern background or heritage as well. Do you think that there's anything in your biography or background that would explain why you're into Austrian economics and, and not fiat economics? Is there anything along <laughs> your life story? <laughs> It can explain it a little bit. Uh, probably, I would say, you know, uh, being uh, Palestinian and having grown up in the Middle East uh, prepared me uh, psychologically very well for the idea that it's uh, it's very easy to look at the newspaper and uh, yes, they are full of uh, nonsense, and it is possible for people who are in positions of authority to be lying. And uh, to uh, and and for the official narrative that you read in the newspapers and the TV to be a nonsense. So I think that might have been the kind of preparation that around 2007, 2008, 2009, as the world was going through the financial crisis, um, it was it, it was it was possible for me to entertain the idea that yep, all of the people that are teaching me economics in Colombia are um, wrong, <laughs> and all of their ideas about economics are completely pointless and useless and they only serve uh, well they're useless for society but they're very useful for the people who pay for them essentially central banks and uh, the banks that benefit from those things uh, but you studied fiat economics so are you telling us there's nothing of any value that you learned at university yes <laughs> <laughs> but it's <laughs> I mean, the only value was in learning the things, um, you know, finding out on your own that they're wrong is kind of valuable, but it's a, it, there are so many better ways of spending five years of your life. Like if, if, if you could just trust somebody or if you had some position, some person in your life that had a, uh, the ability to just tell you, yep, this is all nonsense and you don't need to waste five years of your life. You know, if I spent five years, um, started off as a waiter at a restaurant during those five years, I would have probably worked my way up to <laughs> do something much more useful than spend five years to conclude that, yep, these people don't know what they're talking about. I could have started with that and saved a lot of time. <laughs> sure, and if you had put your wages into Bitcoin, of course, uh, there's all the opportunity cost there. But <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, if you think back uh, to the time with your colleagues in fiat economics, uh, and you spent some time even uh, then uh, at, at a position teaching at university as well. So, what do you say? I mean, obviously, it, it can't be an intelligence issue. Uh, was it an issue of character? Is it just different interests? What makes up the mind of a, a typical fiat economist? I think it's uh, it's simply the, the way that the uh, uh, education is financed. It comes from central banks. Essentially, uh, all of the universities today are dependent on government funding. It's uh, first of all, governments are the ones that provide the students with the loans and the financing to go to the universities. So the universities have to adhere to certain guidelines in order to be eligible for uh, student loans in order for the students to be able to get loans to get into it. So you have to basically tow the fiat line in order to get um, your students to get cheap uh, loans. In other words, the real product in uh, the university is not education. The real product is debt slavery. And so what the university does is that it pre presents debt slaves, who are the real products, the students, to uh, the banking system and the fiat system and um, you know, teaches them nonsense, but gets them indebted for life. So that's one way. The second way is uh, financing of research. So if you want to get funded for your research, there's just no way of um, succeeding and getting research grants. It's a highly competitive world. There's a very limited uh, number of uh, research grants out there available. And your best chance of getting one is to tow the line. In fact, it's basically impossible not to get one without towing the line. So. Uh, there's research that shows in monetary economics, practically all 
published research in monetary economics is financed by the Federal Reserve directly or indirectly. So uh, it's, um, you know, it, it's very obvious what it is. There is no free market system in education. There is no free marketplace of ideas. Ideas aren't allowed to, to be discussed freely. Universities can't adopt ideas freely. The way to survive as a university is to not uh, teach things that are useful for students. The way to survive is to present the students as debt slaves for uh, the government and the banking uh, system. And the way to do that is to just continue to uh, propagate these ideas. So that's why you, know, you can't get away with teaching Austrian economics in most universities. They have to teach the Keynesian stuff. They have to go through the model of how it's done. And so the system at every stage, you know, from, uh, from high school to university to graduate school, at every level, it selects for essentially um, obedience. It selects for people who are willing to close their eyes and say, yep, if you raise aggregate demand, you fix unemployment. If you print money, then you fix all of the world's problems. If you're trying to think critically of things, then uh, you're, you're just not going to make it in academia. The only people that make it are the people who are just going to go around, along and parrot the uh, these lines. And I think, you know, uh, we, historically, you see a lot of stories of intelligent people who are highly uh, frustrated by academia and who couldn't make it by academia and who left. And they have a lot of bad stories to tell about academia. And generally, I would say, you know, before Bitcoin, there was just no other alternative. If you couldn't make it as an academic in fiat academia, you had to go find another job outside and you couldn't be publishing, uh, you couldn't be teaching, you couldn't be doing those things properly because there was just no institutional framework to host those things. And I think that's one of the amazing things about Bitcoin is that it allows somebody like me and a lot of other people to start essentially working outside of that system. I don't want to be part of the university. I left my university job. I don't want to be working for any university anymore. I don't have to write research grants. I don't have to um, change my, uh, I mean, uh, when I was at university trying to get published, the most infuriating thing was to try and dumb down my writing to make it idiotic enough to fit into an academic journal, to try and put in stupid things that make me sound like I could get published in those things, believe in all kinds of nonsense, accept all kinds of ridiculous uh, um, starting points and assumptions, and then use ridiculous methodologies. You had to do those things to get published in academic papers and journals that nobody reads. But that's the only way to keep your uh, job. Well, now we have a different system because of Bitcoin. Um, you don't have to be dependent on them. And you don't have to be dependent on a constant salary. And you don't have to be dependent on a constant um, influx of debt, which is what the, how, how the fiat system works, where you need to constantly be rolling over your debt. So this, this is really, I think, the, the, the intellectual uh, value of Bitcoin, that it is allowing an, an, an alternative educational system to succeed. And it's allowing people to just uh, opt out of the fiat system. And so, you know, since leaving university, I've um, 1000 x the number of students that I reach through my website where I teach online courses. I could teach many, many, many more students every year than I could teach back when I was in uh, Fiat University. So uh, would you say that the animosity of mainstream economists uh, towards Bitcoin is mainly based on their perceiving that their position is threatened? So how do you think they unconsciously perceive uh, the threat by Bitcoin? In, in which way are they threatened by Bitcoin? <laughs> I think the animosity is very well deserved. I think if they truly understood what Bitcoin <laughs> is doing, they would be even more angry about it and it would be uh, providing us with even more fun uh, examples of bitcoin derangement syndrome but fortunately most of them are not bright enough to quite understand what's going on so they realize you know bitcoin is bad uh, because their tv tells them bitcoin is bad because their uh, bank propaganda tells them bitcoin is bad so they go along with the idea that bitcoin is bad it's boiling oceans and so on but uh, I, I don't think they quite realize the extent to it the extent of it <clears throat> But, um, you know, even though it is bad for their uh, kind of uh, world in which, you know, you can continue to just publish nonsense and keep a job, uh, it, it might sound scary that you might lose that. But I think that they'll all be better off if they would just free themselves from this, uh, really, the mental slavery of the fiat system where, no, 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 you have to just believe this nonsense, teach the nonsense, get into debt for the rest of your life, and then Hopefully, you know, you'll manage to continue to make payments on time 
throughout all of your life. So you never get uh, kicked out of your job and never get kicked out of your house. And then, you know, you pass on to another generation that can get into debt for the rest of your life. There is an alternative to that. Um, obviously, you know, um, you can take <laughs> you can take the slave out of the plantation, but you can't take the plantation out of the slave. A lot of people just uh, don't like the idea of taking responsibility for their own life, saving their own money, um, having to make their own mind up. But, you know, <laughs> there's no choice around it, I think. Uh, Bitcoin is going to force uh, people to just take responsibility for their lives. It's going to suck if you're uh, an academic most of the time, but uh, you'll get over it. <laughs> well, I assume no mainstream economist will gladly accept the term fiat economist, right? So you're using the label fiat. Can you give us a brief uh, summary? What's the fiat principle? <laughs> why, why is it such a useful label for so many different phenomena? I think really it is a very powerful label for understanding the world in the 20th century because um, historically there is a natural order to life and money is an essential part of a market economy and money is an enormously important part of the market economy because it is what allocates capital, it is what allocates uh, economic resources and what allows people to make economic calculations. So if you, if you study Mises, you know, the importance of money is that it provides us uh, a method for making economic calculation where you, if you have a business, you have hundreds of inputs and outputs from your business. And the way that you can calculate in order to be able to make profit is to calculate everything in uh, money. So in a world in the 20th century, when money goes from being the market's choice, when in the 19th century, you know, and all throughout history, as I discussed in the Bitcoin standard, you see that always money is whatever is the hardest thing to make. People continue to use the hardest thing as money because it is the thing that is best likely to hold on to its value. And because the things that don't hold on to their value very well don't end up being, um, you know, don't end up holding on to a lot of value. So they end up being bad money. And so the majority of wealth ends up being in the hardest money around. 20th century flips things around. So when you have the hardest money out there, the only way for you to make money is for you to go out there and produce something valuable for other people where they willingly give you money. So whoever ends up being at a university or at any kind of job is only there because they managed to get more money out of people than they spent on making that thing happen. If you run a bakery, the only way that your bakery functions is if it spends less money than it receives. Then the 20th century comes along and we switch money into, a, into essentially a, a government um, loyalty points scheme where, you know, if every time you're loyal to the government, you get a golden star. Um, that's kind of like the kindergarten model of monetary uh, <laughs> instruments. In that world, suddenly, you know, it's no longer about being the best baker or the best university teacher or the best uh, anything. It's about being the most compliant, the most obedient, the most uh, likely to go along with what the government wants. So on the one hand, what fiat money, I think there are really three mechanisms that define fiat world in my mind. On the one hand, it allows government spending, it allows government to spend essentially unlimited as until the government, until the currency collapses. So until the currency collapses, the government can just continue to spend and they can just print money and spend and do whatever they want. So that allows them to influence the market enormously. That allows them to just decide what is an economist and what is not an economist. You can't just be an economist at a major university that doesn't believe in um, idiotic Keynesian uh, theories. You have to, because if not, then you don't get funding, you don't get uh, licensed, you don't get uh, uh, student loans for your university. So fiat money, instead of having a competition and who is the best teacher as based on the market, as based on um, who produces the best good that gets the most revenue from consumers, Fiat money ends up making it so that whoever wins the competition, whoever is at the top, is the one that is able to secure money from government. So the consumer for everything is the government because the government is the one that prints the money and pays for it. So that's the first mechanism. The second mechanism is that it destroys people's ability to save for their future and therefore makes people um, less able to um, provide for themselves and less able to be financially independent. So they become more dependent on the fiat money printer. So eventually, even if you're rich on the fiat system, you can't just stay rich because your money is constantly losing value. So you'd need to go back to the fiat 
well. And you need to keep borrowing and you need to keep continuing to, uh, you know, being credit worthy ideologically, basically, in order to stay in that system. And then the third thing is by taking away people's ability to save for the future, you take away people's ability to think of the future much. You People start discounting the future more. I think this is really important. I think the hardness of money is a very good control knob for our time preference. When we have a money that is hard, it's easy for us to save for the future. The future becomes less uncertain slightly. And so we start factoring in the future more in our decisions. When our money is very inflationary, we have no easy mechanism for providing for our future. So the future becomes more uncertain. So we start discounting the future more. If you've ever been in a place that has had a hyperinflation, like in Lebanon, you see that people's decisions, you know, people's long-term plans just go away because you can't think about what am I going to be doing in five years time. You have no idea what you're going to be doing in five years time. So your, your job is uh, focused on how do I survive until the end of the week or the end of the month. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, it's the end of the year. So people's time horizon declines along with um, the destruction of money from something that is useful as a store of value to something that is just essentially a government loyalty points scheme. So you combine those three factors and that's that's what really is uh, what defines fiat world for me. On the one hand, it's all of these institutions that emerged in the 20th century through government financing at the expense of the free market choices. And I think it's 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 a very, very deep rabbit hole because there's a lot of things that were different in the 20th century from the 19th century. A lot of it is technological. You know, we didn't have TVs and uh, computers and uh, cars and airplanes in the 20th century as widespread. You know, they were invented in the 19th century, but they became widely used in the 20th century. So obviously not everything in the 20th century is a result of fiat. A lot of it is technological, but I think a lot can be attributed to fiat because a lot is clearly the product of a century of government subsidies. And so, you know, my favorite example, the one that we discussed is Keynesian economics. You know, why do we teach this ridiculous fiction in universities? Why does this insanely idiotic idea that there is a trade off between inflation and unemployment? How does it survive? And how can a university continue to teach this when we've had hundreds of examples all throughout the last 50 years that definitively refute this. You know, there is no relationship between unemployment and inflation in the short run. There is no Phillips curve. It's ridiculous. Every if you look at if you try and plot the Phillips curve for any country, you don't get a curve. You just get a blot there's no real relationship going on there. So why does this continue to get taught? Fiat. It's imposed by fiat. And ultimately, the word fiat just means imposition. And so what money does is that it allow, what fiat money does is that it allows governments to impose all of these ridiculous ideas without them suffering from the competition of the market. If we had hard money, if we take away the fiat money, then yeah, sure, government could pass laws that say, you know, your university should teach this and your university should teach that. Um, but without the money to enforce those things, there'll still be people teaching other things. Without the ability to mo move enormous amounts of credit and to take away people's wealth and take away universities' endowments, take away, destroy their values through inflation, without all of that, then you have the ability for a free market to emerge. You know, the university that teaches people uh, nonsense um, in the Keynesian tradition ends up graduating people that are unable to function in the real world, as opposed to people who know uh, how the world actually works. And so these universities would, uh, you know, you'd have a free market in ideas and in education. But I don't think we see that in the 20th century. And we see this, uh, you know, we see it all over. We see it in education, but also we see it in food. Another major chapter uh, in my new book, The Fiat Standard, is in the 20th century, we have a massive drive of industrial food, cheap food. Why, why is the government so interested in subsidizing this? Why do governments subsidize flour and sugar and grains and soy and corn and uh, seed oils? Everywhere in the world, you know, these things are very heavily subsidized. And the part of it is the fact that the government has the money and can do it. But of course, another part of it, and this is the other aspect of fiat life, is that the inflation itself is destroying the people's ability to afford the food that they're used to. So how do you try and change their focus from the fact that, oh, wow, the money is broken? Try and tell them that instead of eating real food, you just should just eat industrial waste. And so if you so the other motivation behind a lot of these uh, silly uh, fiat pseudosciences 
is to hide inflation. I think this is an enormous point. So that's why a lot of people believe in ridiculous, idiotic nonsense like the idea that carbon dioxide emissions are going to boil the oceans or destroy the Earth's temperature or all of these uh, silly, uh, essentially uh, pre-modern and pre-industrial uh, primitive beliefs of the idea that you know if you eat this thing, then you will fix the weather. But if you eat that thing, then no, you're going to cause hurricanes and floods in Pakistan, it's all because of you driving your car. You know, the, the, these, these kind of very idiotic and primitive ideas exist in primitive societies. And they can't exist in societies that are advanced. They can't exist in modern societies that have built modern technologies. So it's a sign of our regression back to primitiveness that, uh, that is caused by the fact that our money is being destroyed. Our money doesn't allow us to accumulate capital like before. And so our money doesn't allow us to consume as we did before. So we see the growth in energy consumption that started with the Industrial Revolution around 1800 stopped around 1970, thanks to inflation. And with that, we move to a world in which instead of growing our energy consumption and improving our quality of life since the 1970s, we've been finding ways of how do we reduce our energy consumption. You know, people, people have been conditioned to think that it's a good thing if you, cons if you consume less energy because you know, it's not going to boil the oceans or something or the other. And, you know, that's, that's why people have been taught the idea that, you know, it's virtue to be poor. You know, you, I'm not going to consume energy. I'm going to take the bus. I'm going to get wet. I'm going to get sick um, because that's going to protect the world from flooding. So these ideas, whether it's in diet or in energy, it's the other side of fiat is, okay, we're destroying your currency. We're destroying your ability to save. We're destroying your ability to consume. But it's going to be okay because we're going to use some of that money to pay a bunch of con artists to go out on TV and tell you, and university, of course, to tell you, no, 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 you don't need to eat meat. Just eat industrial waste. It's better for you because, you know, reasons. And also, you don't need to use modern technology. You don't need a car. You don't need an airplane. You don't need to travel. You don't need uh, anything. Just stay home. Um, of course, you know, um, save the planet and uh, all of these uh, childish uh, slogans. It's just essentially inflation apologia. It's inflation laundering. Uh, all of these... All of this new modern life of our uh, eat the, and eat soy and bugs to save the earth and uh, consume less energy in wind and solar, it's just returning you to living like a 13th century peasant. It's just undoing the industrial revolution because we no longer have the monetary technology ca that can support an industrial society. And we no longer have the, I, I would say even, the intellectual capacity for people to understand what it takes to support a modern, industrial, rational enlightened society we can't we just had that destroyed by the destruction of money uh, thanks Saif. we only have a few more minutes let's move on to austrian economics now uh, quite quite a yeah. few austrian economists have been government employees and a few still work in academia most of which didn't really get bitcoin so far so how, how do you think is austrian economics is is better or unique uh, what is its strongest point I think Austrian economics is just what economics would be if we hadn't had the catastrophe of government money to try and distort economics in order to justify inflation to the benefit of uh, special interests, banks and governments. It's, um, it's just Austrian economics as it existed up until uh, the early 20th century and as it continued is what the world of economics would have been without uh, the distortion that is fiat without government distortion of the economy. So the, the main value proposition is that uh, it's not advertisement for inflation. I think this is this is what I would say. Like the, the rest of the economics is just, um, you know, if you, if you read Keynesian economics, if, if you start with the idea that this is all just motivated reasoning to arrive at the conclusion that inflation is actually good for you, then it all makes sense. And, and this is how I used to teach Keynesian economics at university. I tell my students, look, this entire textbook is a very elaborate joke, a very elaborate hoax to try and get you to believe that money printing is the, is the answer. So if you're taking the exam and you don't know what the answer is, you know, you don't understand the question, just go with money printing because that's what they want you to arrive at. That's always the answer. So Keynesian economics is just around how to justify inflation, how to how to make inflation acceptable for people. Austrian economics is just the application of 
uh, human mental capacities toward understanding problems of economics. So I think it's a much more powerful tool and much more reality based and much better as a way of understanding the world. Um, sure, it's it's not most likely to get you success if you're uh, in the fiat educational system, but um, I think. You know, you look at, I think, I think something very important has happened in the last two years in terms of the inflation. Up until 2019, the average Keynesian economist and the average kind of, uh, let's say, um, high salary person working within the fiat system was able to beat inflation, you know, between the, or, or at least was able to beat inflation in their own mind. They look at inflation as being the CPI and they looked at their stock portfolio beating the CPI. And so they thought, oh, well, you know, inflation is a good thing. It's what makes my stock portfolio go up. And they could fool themselves into believing the ridiculous Keynesian idea that it's inflation that gives us economic growth. 2020 to 2022, I think that's changed drastically. And I think a lot of people are going to revisit those things because what, are, what you see over the last two years is, you know, the, the uh, stocks and bonds are crashing Um uh, while at the same time the value of money is declining. So basically, a lot of people that would have usually been the beneficiaries of the fiat system, or at least in their mind, they think the fiat system is working for them, have gotten massively hurt over the last couple of years. And looking at the way that things are working politically, I don't think there's any real scope of things improving. I think we're going to get more inflation and we're going to get more currency destruction and we're going to get more gaslighting about the solution for inflation being for you to go back to living like a 13th century peasant, not for central banks to stop printing money. This is, I think, the real fiat idea. This is the point that I'm trying to get at from the writing the book, The Fiat Standard, that the way that the inflation manifests is through all of these idiots telling you that you're gonna burn, you're gonna boil the oceans and burn the earth unless you live like a 13th century peasant. If you eat meat, if you consume oil, if you own a car, if you live like a 20th century, 19th century, civilized human being, you're going to ruin the weather for all of us. And so you need to go back to poverty. This is what inflation is. And I'm just going to keep beating that drum because I think it's, it, 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 you know, it's true. I think it's, it was easier for the fiaters to hide this before 2020, but I think we've crossed the Rubicon in 2020. And I think we've gotten into a world where uh, even, even the apologists for the regime need to start thinking about their own uh, interest because I don't think the regime is, uh, is going to work for the vast, vast majority of people um, now. Sais, so, thanks a lot. We have an incredibly dense program here. Thank you. Hope Thank to talk you. to you soon. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.